test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. Part 1. You'll hear someone booking transport for a trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Good morning, Burnham Coaches. Sarah speaking. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good morning. I'm a teacher at the Down Language School. We have a bit of a problem, and I was wondering if you could help us out. What is the problem exactly? Well, we normally take our students on an excursion at the end of their course. But unfortunately, the coach firm we normally use has let us down. It seems they've gone out of business. I'm sorry to hear that. I suppose you are looking for a replacement. Well, yes. We won't need a very large coach, actually. There will be 30 students and four teachers. So that's 34 in all. And what dates did you have in mind? The last Saturday and Sunday of this month. That's the 28th and 29th. The 28th and 29th. Does that mean you are planning to stay somewhere overnight? That's right. Actually, we want to do the same excursion that we do every year. We usually visit Stonehenge, Salisbury and stay overnight in Bath. It's a historical tour, really. It sounds interesting. Let me just see what we have available. Oh dear, I'm afraid all our coaches are booked out for the 28th. It's the busiest time of the year for us, actually. I was afraid that would be a problem. But you have a coach available for the 29th? Yes, we do. And it's available for the 30th as well, if that's any help to you. I'm afraid not. Sunday is the last day. The students go home on Monday. I think we'll just have to change our plans a bit and leave out Salisbury. It's a shame, but I don't think we can fit in all three places in one day. So, you would like to book the coach for the 29th, visiting Stonehenge and Bath, is that right? Yes, I think so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. Right, I just need a few details, sir. OK. My name is Paul Scott. S-C-O-T? It's double T, actually. I'm sorry. And it's the Down Language School. Could you give me the address for that, Mr Scott? Yes, it's Down House, Hill Street, Brighton. Do you need the postcode? No, that's not necessary but I do need a contact number. Of course. The number for the school secretary is 01273 512 634. You can contact her if you need to speak to anyone. Right. And what time would you like the coach to pick you up? Well, I think we'll have to make an early start. Would 7.30 be all right? Yes, no problem at all. What time do you want to be back? Oh, any time between 10 and 11 will be all right. Not later than 11, though. Right, I'll make a note of that. 11 p.m. latest. There's just one more thing I need to know. Presumably, you'll be visiting Stonehenge first. How long do you want to stay there? Well, we normally stay about an hour. The main objective of the excursion is for the students to see the Georgian architecture in Bath, really. Yes, Bath is lovely, isn't it? 
I was there myself a couple of years ago. I thought the Royal Crescent was absolutely stunning. I hadn't realised how large it is. Well, I think that's all I need to know, Mr Scott. Thank you for booking with us. Just a minute. There's one thing you seem to have forgotten. How much will this cost? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I was thinking about Bath. Just bear with me a moment. Yes, it's a round trip of 300 miles and a total time of 16 hours for the driver. For a 45-seater coach, that will be a total of £500, including tax and insurance. Do we have to have such a large coach? There are only 34 of us. We don't have any smaller coaches, I'm afraid. Oh, well. At least we won't be cramped for space. When do we have to pay? We require a 20% deposit to confirm the booking. I suggest that you do that as soon as possible, today if you can. The balance you can give to the driver if you're paying by cheque. Have the cheque made out to Burnham Coaches. I think that'll be all right. I will have to check this with the school accountant, but if all is well, I'll arrange for someone to bring you the deposit within the next two hours. That'll be fine, Mr Scott. Well, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear two university students discussing experiments. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Al. Sorry to interrupt you when you're having your lunch, but I wanted to ask you a favour. Oh, sure, no problem. Sit down, Josie. I've finished anyway. What do you need? Well, I was wondering if I could ask you about the experiments we were talking about in the seminar the other day with Dr Robinson. I'm doing my teaching practice on Thursday and Friday, and I'm a bit concerned about it. I wasn't entirely sure I understood them completely. If I don't understand them, then the pupils don't have any chance. You mean the ones to determine the speed of sound? Yes, that's right. Well, I think I understood the first one, but the second one was more complicated. Yes, that's true. Well, let's check what you thought of the first one, the one that you'll have to take the kids outside for. OK, let me see. Well, you need to get two groups to stand exactly 200 metres apart on the playing fields and one has a bell or a loudspeaker or some other loud sound source and a flag and the other group has a stopwatch. Yes, although it doesn't have to be 200 metres. It's just that it makes the experiment easier the more distance between them. It depends on the space available. Right, and the idea is that one group raises the flag at exactly the same moment as they make a noise and the other group starts the stopwatch when they see the flag and stops it when they hear the noise. That's it. And then you get them to do a simple calculation of velocity equals time divided by distance. Mia, yeah, it's a bit low-tech and it's not very accurate, but they should be able to get within about 20% of the actual figure if they're reasonably careful. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Okay, so I understand that. It's the other one, the one with the tube I was having a few problems with. Can you just talk me through that and tell me exactly what I have to explain to the pupils? Okay. Well, the thing to remember is that sound is a wave, and waves have both frequency and wavelength. You should start them off with exploring waves in water, and that'll introduce a few key concepts. Sound waves aren't exactly the same because they're compression waves, but it's more or less the same principle, at least for pupils at this level. I've got some ideas for that. So, they understand wavelength and frequency, and then we move on to the experiment. For that we need, uh, let me just have a look at my notes, a long tube, a tuning fork, and a large barrel of water. Now, what do they do with those? And what's the point of it? It's fairly simple, really. You just have to remember that velocity equals wavelength times frequency. Ah, yes. That's the key, isn't it? Yes. The tuning fork is manufactured to produce a sound of a given frequency. So that just leaves you one thing to measure. The pupils hit the tuning fork so that it makes a sound and hold it toward the end of the long open tube. That makes the air vibrate. They should slowly move the tube up and down. They'll find that in some positions it gets louder. That's because of resonance. What's that again? It's when there are a whole number of waves in the column of air in the tube. It makes it louder. They then measure the length of the column of air and they can work out the wavelength from that. And that's more accurate than the other experiment? Well, it is if the pupils take an average using different tuning forks. It should be much more accurate. Thanks, Al. That's clear to me now. I can't think of any more problems. Just make sure that the pupils keep good records. You need to tell them how important that is. Any mistakes with the maths can be corrected later, but you don't want them to have to go back and get the data again. You probably wouldn't have time for that anyway. Good advice, yes. I just hope it goes well in the classroom now. Good luck. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about old racing cars. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. The Goodwood Museum is currently celebrating some of the most extravagant types of car design in its Festival of Speed. Here's our reporter, Vincent Freed, who's on site to tell us about some of the cars on display. Well, here I am, standing in front of one of the most prestigious cars ever built, the Duesenberg. A fantastically expensive, luxurious car built in the early part of the 20th century and bearing all the glamorous qualities of the Jazz Age. How many were there? Well, only 473 Duesenberg J-types were ever built, and the model here is one of the rarest. Each had a short 125-inch chassis or framework, and the body was always in the form of an open two-seater. The technology behind the car's 6.9-litre engine was extraordinary. It featured capsules of mercury in the engines to absorb vibration and provide an incredibly smooth ride. In fact, these cars offered unparalleled performance. 
in an age when 160 kilometers per hour was considered very fast, the Duesenberg promised a top speed of 180 kilometers per hour and could do 140 kilometers per hour in second gear. Duesenberg, who designed the car, sold it as a frame and engine. This was typical of the age again, and many prestige manufacturers such as Rolls-Royce did exactly the same. Owners able to afford the hefty $9,000 price tag for the basic car would then commission a coachwork company to build a body tailored to their own individual requirements. The Duesenberg's great attraction for the driver was its instrument panel, which offered all the usual features, but also several others, including a stopwatch. It was the Duesenberg's technology that lay behind its success as a racing car, and they dominated the American racing scene in the 1920s, winning the Indianapolis Grand Prix in 1924, 25 and 27. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. On to another celebrity, the 1922 Léa Helica. Only 30 of these French propeller cars were built, and the model here at Goodwood, which was the fourth to be made, is thought to be the only surviving example still capable of running. The brains behind this car was Marcel Léa, who was an aviation pioneer first and foremost, and the influence of flying is quite apparent in the car. The Leia very strongly resembles a light aircraft with its front propeller, but in this case, it's minus any wings, of course. It's quite odd to think that this car was whirring through France just as the Duesenberg was blasting down roads at 160 kilometers per hour across the Atlantic. The Leias were used regularly in France in the 1920s and were even produced in saloon and van form, as well as two-seater. The Leia matched its propeller drive with its equally bizarre steering, which used the rear rather than the front wheels. But despite looking rather frail, it was a tough machine. In fact, when troops tried to steal it during the Second World War, the car's baffling design was clearly beyond the would-be thieves, and it ended up being driven into a tree, breaking the propeller. And now for the Firebird, this extraordinary car. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a postgraduate psychology student talking to other students about a job satisfaction study he has investigated. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. 
For my presentation today, I'm going to report on an assignment that I did recently. My brief was to analyze the methods used in a small study about job satisfaction and then to make recommendations for future studies of a similar kind. The study that I looked at had investigated the relationship between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction amongst workers. For this purpose, employees at a call center had been asked to complete a questionnaire about their work. I'll summarize the findings of that study briefly now. First of all, female full-time workers reported slightly higher levels of job satisfaction than male full-time workers. Secondly, female part-time workers reported slightly higher levels of satisfaction than female full-time ones did. On the other hand, male part-time workers experienced slightly less job satisfaction than male full-time workers. But although these results seemed interesting and capable of being explained, perhaps the most important thing to mention here is that in statistical terms, they were inconclusive. Personally, I was surprised that the findings hadn't been more definite, because I would have expected to find that men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would experience different levels of satisfaction. So I then looked more carefully at the methodology employed by the researchers to see where there may have been problems. This is what I found. First of all, the size of the sample was probably too small. The overall total of workers who took part in the survey was 223, which sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into subgroups, also, the numbers in the different subgroups were unequal. For example, there were 154 workers in the full-time group, but only 69 in the part-time group. And amongst this part-time group, only 10 were male, compared to 59 who were female. Secondly, although quite a large number of people had been asked to take part in the survey, the response was disappointingly low. A lot of them just ignored the invitation. And workers who did respond may have differed in important respects from those who didn't. Thirdly, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call center for distribution, the researchers had had very limited control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For instance, their responses to questions may have been influenced by the views of their colleagues. All these problems may have biased the results. In the last part of my assignment, I made recommendations for a similar study, attempting to remove the problems that I've just mentioned. Firstly, a much larger sample should be targeted, and care should be taken to ensure that equal numbers of both genders and both full- and part-time workers are surveyed. Secondly, the researchers should ensure that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves. And should they require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions so that the possibility of influence from other colleagues is eliminated? Finally, as workers may be unwilling to provide details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's important that the researchers reassure them that their responses will remain confidential and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time if they want to. By taking measures like these, the reliability of the responses to the questionnaires is likely to be increased, and any comparisons that are made are likely to be more valid. So, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.